What is going on, guys? The Main Stand Podcast back for episode 34. 35 for those of you who've been here since episode zero. Yeah, who's counting, though? Not definitely not us. I have, I have more important things to focus on, like Super Sunday coming up. Uh, we've got a hectic week of football ahead of us, boys. Yeah, how are we feeling? We'll get into it definitely throughout this episode. This is like the penultimate es- episode for us. We are heading in to Liverpool City this weekend, uh, but we got some housekeeping to do. Josh, how uh, how do we do for uh, for picks this week? I think the picks sucked last week, if we're being honest, and I uh, got bamboozled today in the Europa League. Might never touch the Europa League ever again. Uh, just absolutely horrendous results. But we're gonna we're gonna bounce back this week. I'm feeling good about the picks. Uh, got some research in, you know, today around lunchtime and gonna crank out some picks this weekend. Hopefully, hopefully do good. I think we got three featured picks for the Man City Liverpool game. So we're going to roll those out, but, uh, let's talk some MLS boys. Cause I need to hear how the Rebs are doing. <laughs> I know I have some stuff to say about Minnesota United. I don't want to talk about the MLS. I don't want, I'm not having fun anymore. The Rev, uh, you guys aren't scoring 100 points, so you guys are ready to call it quits. We've only yeah. got three, like five this year. We fucking stink. Uh, yeah, we we uh, conceded an own goal in the, what? 82nd eight, minute. 92nd minute this uh, this past week. Uh, to, to lose to 10-man. 10 man New 10 York man Red, Red Bulls 1 0. Uh, Andy Farrell tried to clear a ball. Matt Polster was on top of him. It just deflected off a of Polster, went in, and it was a shambles game. It was very physical, uh, but definitely not feeling hot in New England right now. Yeah, it's always that's a tough start to the season you guys have had. I know Minnesota, we're coming like kind of kind of coming down off our little high that we had. We're just really not that good of a team, to be completely honest. And I don't think we know our best starting eleven. Still missing some players too. We played Seattle. I was at the game. Uh, crowd was great again, as always. But our final ball was just abysmal, like a literal schoolyard team. Uh, Jordan Morris ran up and down the wing all night too, just absolutely demonizing our defense. Yo, you know you're down bad when Jordan Morris is ripping you up. Yeah, Jordan Morris like literally killed us. He was the one that kind of – it was an own goal deflection, the, the second goal they scored, but uh, he was behind it. Reynoso got one back on a penalty, but it felt like the 10 minutes we were going to level things up, but, I mean, you can't just not show any life for the first 80 and expect to beat you know a team like Seattle that's pretty good on paper. Uh, so we're kind of figuring out just like what we've always known – in the first five games which is we're not a very good team and we were pretty lucky to see eight points from the first four games so we'll see how it goes the rest of the season um i think we have austin this weekend so that's a definite game we could win but is what it is i feel like the revs can't win any games anymore i'm just it just doesn't something's not right in the air it'll level out though it it will level out eventually it's just having so much I wouldn't even call it pressure. Like we knew it was going to be different going into it with the, with the departures of some of our, our top players, Tejan leaving for Bruges. Um, and then having a lot of veteran pieces come in that definitely didn't fit what we were necessarily doing last year. Um, it's just, it, it hasn't been balanced yet. We haven't found our footing. There was just a lot of expectations with the, the CONCACAF Champions League that fell through, and then just not a lot of, uh, not a lot of hope right now. We'll, we should we'll we should get three points this weekend, though. We're playing Inter-Miami, and if anyone is fucking worse than us, it's them. You see, uh, David Beckham's son Romeo had three hat tr- or had a hat trick of assists in uh, Inter Miami two's game. I didn't see that against no. Philly. He had some, yeah, he had some wonder balls going in there. Uh, so he might get a call up here pretty soon. But Phil Neville is in charge of that team, which yep. tells you all you need to know. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we we had the pleasure of seeing them in our in our last home game last year before the playoffs. Interesting side they have. Yeah, but we'll we'll leave it at that. Is Blaze Matweedy still there? I, I think so. so. Yes, 
That's always that. Yeah, that's a funny one. And, and isn't Higuain up top still as well? We'll find out this weekend, but I'm pretty sure he is. I'm I'm excited. A couple weeks, we got Chicago Fire. I'm going to that one. See Big Shaq. Oh, that should be sweet. You get to see local legend Shaq. Yeah, Power Cube, Alpine Messi. <laughs> let's uh, let's stop talking about MLS because it's a little depressing. Yeah, it, We're both not on is. good vibes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let's talk some FIFA stuff. Uh, the first one. Let's carry just... on the bad vibes, Josh. Let's yeah, do it. Yeah, we're, we're true. Not really a happy subject. Uh, the first thing being a possible switch to a hundred minute games in the Qatar World Cup. I mean, I know what your guys' takes are on this, but what are your takes for the rest of the people? So, here's the thing that I saw. I'm, I'm confirming it on a Google search right now. But what I saw wasn't that they were necessarily saying, like, we're going to play 50-minute halves. It was basically making stoppage time, like, way more lenient. So like you'd be more apt to see five or six minutes at the end of every half for whatever reason. They weren't going to alter the rules to say we're playing 50 minutes minimum per half, but like that's what I read was was they were yeah, they're they're lengthening stoppage time to potentially extend matches to 100 minutes. It's not like set in stone. I think it's a fucking bad it's stupid either way. Let me just say that too. I think it's fucking dumb. It's, it is. Like, if you, regardless of what's going on, I don't think you need to come out and say, yeah, we'll be more lenient with giving an extra minute at the, at the end of, end of a half. I think context to the game is important. I think added yeah. time at the end of halves is important to what's going on. Cause if you're like, yeah, we're going to put it around five minutes. If, if they already have that in their head, then what happens when something happens with a fan involved or a player involved, it goes longer. Like we don't complain, but now that it's out in the ether, now that it's been put out there that there could be this potential five minute, I'm not saying minimum, but if that's their like target time, like it just, it adds to a level of, okay, why are we, why are we fixing it to be this? Why are we putting it at this? Like, Two and also, this minutes is a, halves. The terrible World Cup to be trying it with with it's like fucking thirty nine yeah. billion degrees in Qatar every single day. It's so question Let's... for you guys, because of that, do you think there's like set this might be a logistics thing we just haven't read up on? Do you think they're trying to account for like water breaks and stuff in each half? They they could That be. could be true, and if that's the case, it makes a little more sense. Yeah, um, like noting that they're going to happen, so we have a set five minute extra time, or at least like close to that, just to account for like the times for water breaks in the around the twenty five sixty five minute mark. Yeah, that would be a, a weird way. Yeah, I, I guess that makes sense to me. It's just funny that like now they care about the safety of individuals. Yeah, I mean, you can say that <laughs> for the Qatar World Cup in general. While we're on the subject of the World Cup, <laughs> not. Just- I got a I got a side tangent to go on. Okay. Why is the mascot so fucking scary looking this year? It's just it's just like a it's like a it's like Casper the Ghost. It's like it's I a fucking... literally compared it to Casper. I was talking to Bass right after, and I said they ripped off Casper. It's like it's a fucking anthropomorphic piece of fucking clothing. It's, just, yeah. it's terrifying, dude. Like, stop making things that shouldn't have a face have a face. End rant. Well, Pat, you bring up a good point because we didn't have this in the notes. Again, not a logistics company. We didn't talk about the World Cup draw at all. (laughs) (laughs) We recorded last Wednesday. It happened Friday. Uh, It's been like one of those things where it's like it's long enough where it feels like weird to talk about now, but we haven't talked about it yet. It's it's like out of the news cycle, but like we should definitely be talking about it. If anything, we can just quickly chat about the group the U.S. got drawn into because holy fucking shit, that one's loaded. Um, Black Friday is going to be a hell of a hell of a derby. Yeah, so the U.S.'s group, it's one of Scotland. It's like Scotland, Ireland, and Ukraine is the third team. Scotland, and then, Wales, and Ukraine. Yeah, Scotland, Wales, Ukraine. 
Scotland, Wales, Ukraine, England, the USA, and Iran are in a group. And wow. Wow. Is all I have to say about that. Uh, we could win it. Uh, not win it. We could get out. You know, I'm just thinking from a sporting standpoint. Like, it's possible, right? Right. I think we'll get out. I, I hope. It's doable, but I think it depends on a couple of things. Uh, I think we're we... better than Iran. Definitely. Are... I've heard good things about Iran, though, that they've kind of ran Asia. Uh, I've heard they're actually not bad, and we all know, was it 98 we lost to Iran? Yeah, so never mind. I'm just going to stop talking. (laughs) (laughs) No, I I definitely think it's definitely in our hands. At this point, it is in our hands. We just have to go out and figure out how to play and win a game of football at the end of the day. If we go out and we get points and we look at one game at a time instead of, oh, this is a group of death. Oh, we got to look at this game, this game, and this game all at the same time. We're not going to make it out of the group. We're going to fold like a little fucking chair, a what, shitty metal chair. What team do you guys want as the fourth team? Any preference? No, not really. At, at this I mean, point, it's already kind of set in, set in stone that it's going to be a difficult I yeah, Wales have quality, Scotland have quality, and Ukraine have quality. So, like, no matter who gets put into the group, it's a, like, you know, it's a, it's a Euro, like, yeah. make it's a make the Euros quality team, no matter who gets plopped into the group. So, it's it's, it's a tough game. I'll be I honest, really I don't want it. Ukraine. I think Ukraine's going to be tough with something to play for. Yeah, I think, I think, get it, if Ukraine in our, in our group, it's where I don't see us getting out if it's Ukraine. I think, like, probably Wales all things considered yeah they have Gareth Bale but outside of that they don't have like a ton of quality all over the pitch uh you know Scotland have it in a couple more areas to just forward um Scotland did just lose uh Tierney looks like probably for yeah for the foreseeable for the future summer. so they I mean the Robertson being said, again Che Adams but they're probably less deep than a team like Wales yeah, and we've also seen, but, but that I guess on the Wales front, we've seen what uh, one really world class player, uh, Alfonso Davies, can do to this U.S. men's national yeah. team side. So I'm a little hesitant to say I want Wales in the group over anyone, uh, but I think Ukraine are the most well rounded side, and they really, like you mentioned, really have something to play for. So that's that's a really tough game. Just from, like, a geopolitical standpoint, the fact of Ukraine possibly being in a group with the U.S. and England, like, not to get too much into that right now, but it's just, like, a very interesting dynamic overall. Uh, uh, hey, man, Iran is in the same group yeah. as the U.S. and England. I, yeah, it, very good point. Do you think we'll beat England? It's a one. Will we beat England? Funny. Man? I laughed really hard when I saw the draw. If that, you know, for, for, what, for what it's worth. You imagine Pulisic just shows up on Black Friday and gets us the result. I mean, dude, we beat England on Black Friday. Oh my dude, the banter is gonna be unreal. Watermark unreal. Dude, moment for U.S. soccer. Derby is gonna be lit. Yeah, looking forward to it. Um, last thing from like an administrative standpoint, um, UEFA. On conversely from FIFA. Um, talking about doing some sort of historical qualification for teams that don't make the top four in big leagues. So, like, if Man United didn't make top four in England, they could still qualify based on historical qualifications. Which oh, that's be a an... crock of shit. Yeah, they're, they're saying, you're like, fucking anything... fucking bad, two... you're fucking bad. Yeah, what we're hearing now is, like, two spots could be up uh, for teams that have, like, historical prowess. Uh, which means, you know, Nottingham Forest and Villa would be up there too. Nottingham Forest, Villa, AC Milan should make it every year. Liverpool should make it every year, even if you guys get relegated somehow. Real Madrid always should be there. Um, Who else? Bayern, they have like three CLs. Bayern should always make it. Ajax. 
Ajax. Ajax should always be in the Champions League. Benfica. Benfica. That means Benfica always have to make it. It's kind of hypocritical, though, based on like what everyone was complaining about last year with the Super League. About it's what I'm saying. If you're bad, you're bad, and yeah. that's history doesn't mean shit if you're not like actually a good football team right now. And it, it that feels like a handhold to like the established elite, if you ask me, from someone who's yeah the yeah, type of fan that i am yeah I don't know. If your team isn't playing good ball you shouldn't be in the champions league yep no and you shouldn't get all the reward that comes with it exactly uh and it's ultimately you know i think uefa probably grabbing a little bit towards tv ratings and money on their side as well because you know they want man united to be in the competition just as much as man united want to be in the competition themselves you know, I wouldn't mind Man United being in the competition, though. They can get out of their group, get bounced in the round of 16 every year, so they're never going to win anything, and they have to just play a couple more games, and it just adds to, to the amount we can banter them yeah. until they get out of this banter era, which looks like it might be – they have a good chance next year to actually do something. Um, yeah, with the Ten Hag, uh, Ten Hag <laughs> news and then Woodward gone. Yep, so t- Ten Hag yeah, – what we were saying a couple weeks ago. Ten Hag plus Raniak and like a more, you know, director of football, scouting, pick the players kind of role. They they look like they're building something for the future. So yep. I'm gonna banter them while I can. Uh next piece of news before we kind of get into the full episode. Um Pep Guardiola. I <laughs> need Pat to address the news. What what do you think about the rumors of him possibly going? To, uh, I think Brazil. it's insane, man. I think it's crazy. I, I think if anything, we're going to see Pep sign an extension. Uh, he pretty much, I don't know why it's news. He pretty much dismissed the room, dismissed it like right after it was brought up. He, he basically said to the reporters, Brazil has plenty of great coaches in Brazil to coach the national team. Yep. Um, I just don't see it. I don't, I don't see it happening. I, I think in, in, you just look at the pattern that Pep has taken in his managerial roles he's finished up his tenure he's taken a year off and then he's taken another job he's finished up his tenure he's taken a year off and then he's taken another job i don't see him a jumping ship from this city project that he's like worked pretty hard to get to where it is right now and to just leave at the end of 2022 um i think pep stays for 10 years total i think he leaves in 2025 that's been what I've been saying for a couple of years now. Uh, I, I think it is a really, really good system for him in place. And I, I think with a couple of the guys like Cancelo and Ruben Diaz and John Stones now, it looks like Phil Foden's about to sign a contract. Raheem Sterling, Bernardo Silva's on the horizon. There's talks of us signing Holland in the summer. I, I don't see Pep leaving until he can really see out what he's created here. So yeah, I, I think it's crazy. I don't, I don't see it happening. I think it's convenient that with this big push with City and Liverpool playing the Champions League going up with City, all this media stuff kind of starting to get stirred up around City. The the Der Spiegel leaks are from fucking five years ago. A bunch of stuff about that came out today, day of recording too. So I think it's convenient that there's all this media storm around around City and the lead up to a couple of big games. That's Maybe that's the conspiracy theorist in me. But I think that's a crock of shit, and I think Pep is staying. Here's thought... my two cents. Go Sorry, real quick, Josh. Uh, it, Pep has Pep has set City up uh, for the future. He has done what he needs to do, and he's off to Brazil. He's gonna go vacation with you know some some good food and some good music and some good drinks, and he's gonna he's gonna win a World Cup with uh, with Brazil. He's gone. Bye bye. Yeah, you'd like that, so he stops yep. tormenting you. Yep. See ya. It's probably the only place he could go with more drama queens than Man City. <laughs> Pep doesn't Pep doesn't like drama at all. There's very little drama in the city locker room. You relax. <laughs> That's uh it is a non story at the end of the day. Uh, but I had to get Pat's <laughs> thoughts on it. Uh just How could we have talked about how Jack Grealish is about to be the ambassador for Gucci? I was just gonna say this. That's that a weird today. weird timing to come out to. <laughs> if Jack Grealish was not English and he announced that deal the week before Liverpool City and Liverpool beat City, he would get eviscerated in the newspapers. But he's English, so we probably won't hear anything about it even if Liverpool do win. I don't get why it's Jack Grealish. I get he's all he's you know, handsome and Oh he, yeah, but, but he has it like that. 
I, I think it should be Saint Maximin. I'm handsome too. Like, if why any not me? Footballer should have gotten the Gucci deal. It should have been Alan Saint Maximin. He was wearing Gucci headbands in France. I love, I love, I love Super Jack. I love our Mister Gucci now. But it, it, it should have been Alan. It should have been Saint Maximin. Hundred, hundred, hundred percent. I'm not sure he gets enough exposure. I, I right. do like Jack. I would if I'm Alan St. Maxman, I'm a little pissed. Oh yeah, definitely because he repped the brand pretty hard. Uh, but we move. Uh, we got a new segment this week. Uh, well, kind of bridging off last week, I guess we had uh, yeah. Kevin from the Lads Podcast do Legends Five Aside. We're each gonna do one over the next three weeks. So I am up first. Um, so I'm gonna start with. My goalie, I'm going to start from the back and build up. Goalie, I'll take um, Casillas. I think he's the most dominant goalie of the 2000s. Won two Euros, World Cup. Um, I mean, I don't think there's another better goalie that, like, I think it'd be kind of weird if I took, like, Lev Yashin or someone that I've never watched before. Why not? The Black Spider, come on. (laughs) Trophy's named after the man. I think there's a few other options that you guys could take. Not that you guys can't like repeat picks or anything, but I think there's a few other options out there, not to name names. Uh, but Casillas is like an easy one. You can't really argue much against it. I've got my goalie locked in already. Do I know you? I've got my five. I've got my team picked out when it's my week. Fair enough. I'm going to, I'm going to do one defender. Uh, he's Italian. I'm going to go Paolo Maldini. Uh, probably one of the more naturally gifted defenders, uh, again, of that kind of 90s, 2000s generation. Could play outside back, could play center back. Was just class all around the field, and he just had kind of that aura about him that's different than any player of that er- era. He, he literally did carry an aura around him anywhere he went. Um, and I think when I think of legends, he's one of the first that comes to mind. There was obviously a ton of other defensive legends on that AC Milan side, uh, but he's always the first one I think of. Unbelievable jawline, too. Yeah, he's a sculpted Max. man. Dude's fucking handsome. Now, Chiseled. Now I'm going to break into the midfield uh, with my first midfielder. I'm going to kind of go two attacking mids. Um, first one being this guy, Wesley Snyder. Ooh. Ultimately, uh, again, this is like not a best um, necessarily Legends 5 aside. It's kind of your favorite. Wesley Snyder's probably my favorite player that – didn't play for Liverpool. Um, I think at like his peak, he was the best player in the world. Um, not just as a midfielder, but literally best player in the world. Um, I love him in this Galatasaray side too. Just him rocking that Jersey. I need to get my hands on one or like, I already have the, the Galatasaray scarf. I need a Wesley Snyder Galatasaray Jersey. Uh, man could just bang goals and do everything on the pitch that was asked of him. Um, and Quality then, player. Probably should have won a Ballon d'Or in 2010. Yep, exactly. Other midfielder, have to go Stevie G. That one's not even really up for discussion. He was always going to be one of my mids. Uh, you know, has a rocket of a foot, could pass the ball 80 yards. Uh, <laughs> the words speak for themselves. I mean, Jared's just one of the best players of all time. He's got a special place in my heart, too. <laughs> oh, shut the I fuck up. <laughs> and then um, up top, I only have one person in mind for this. He was the first player I really like my first highlight player um, where you're really first getting into soccer and you watch that highlight reel on YouTube and you're like, you just fall in love with it. Um, and it's R9. Uh, I'm not a Zlatan guy, not a Ronaldinho guy. I need R9 up top. Uh, the triangle hair during that world cup. I mean, just everything about him was so memorable. And one of the things I like most about him now is that He's completely just having a good time with life. Uh, man just is from Brazil, likes barbecue, likes beer, and is just having the time of his life after footy. Uh, nothing to not like about R9. Yeah, he's a fucking man. So, Casillas, Maldini, Gerard Schneider, and R9 for me. That That's my Legends 5-a-side team. With that being said, I think we can get into the week's review. Uh, you guys want to kick it off with the Prem? Let's do it. Yeah. Run through them real quick. Uh, Let me open up the notes. I forgot. (laughs) 
I think I think do we kick it off with kind of like the sh- the shock result from the weekend? Yeah, go for it. Let's do it. Uh, Chelsea one, Brentford four. Uh, Rudiger with a goal of the season, uh, contender for sure, absolute banger. Not sure what the celebration was all about. Kind of sussed me out. But Brentford bounced back big. Uh, Erickson grabbing a goal as well. It, it was just a, it was a fun game. It was a fun game all around. Um, and that was, was that at Stamford Bridge, I believe? Yep. Yep. So, so Chelsea falling at home uh, to Brentford. That was, that was probably my match of the weekend. A lot of fun. I like seeing yeah, it was a lose. pretty crazy result. Uh, definitely no one saw it coming. Um, kind of set Chelsea up for the UCL later in the week, but talk about that when we hit the court, the champions league. Uh, yeah. Great goal from Rudiger, but honestly, I think the storyline of the game was Erickson finally getting a goal after what happened to him in the Euros. Uh, it's really good to see him back on the score sheet. Good to see him back playing ball. Dude's on and, form. I mean, he's been scoring loads for Denmark. Yeah. Brent Brentford played really well too. So yeah. hats off to them. Big, big three points for the boom, for the, the the bees, and yeah, they'll they'll be they'll be in the prem next year for sure. So it's it's cool to see. For sure. What game do you guys want to talk about next? You want to dive right into the Liverpool Man City stuff with who they want? Uh, I think another one worth note or worth note talking about uh, is Palace thrashing Arsenal three nil. Um, I I think it's time to to talk about it. Patrick Vieira is doing a phenomenal job yeah. with that palace side. And, and I, I feel like he, he as a manager isn't getting spoken about enough this season. He's taken points off of almost every one of the top teams in the prem in some way, shape or form. Um, he's managed to hold, he's managed to take four points off the city which in its own right is impressive. 3-0 thrashing of Arsenal has them comfortably mid-table right now. He's got them playing really, really well. Um, and, and this Palace side could could very well, um, you know, go on and, and make a run in the FA Cup or something like that. I, I'm, I've been really impressed with them uh, once the team kind of found their stride mid-season under Vieira. And uh, yeah, I just think the team is really good. And I think another big big result for that side in this win over arsenal what do you guys think i think i think palace the future of palace and what we'll see over the next couple of years hinges on what happens with uh connor gallagher if he's a chelsea loanee right now correct um so if if he ends up getting signed permanently or if he ends up going back to chelsea i think that could either help or hurt palace a lot i think he brings a lot to this side both in intensity and in production so we'll we'll see how that plays out, but I I do think Patrick Vieira has been uh, unbelievable, absolutely immense this season for for Palace. They definitely needed a a kick in the pants, a, a direction, so to speak, and they've gotten it. Mm-hmm. I think the game speaks a lot to Arsenal too. Palace don't have anything to play for in the middle of the table, to be honest. They're at like thirty seven points. They're not really going to go down too much. Probably can't go up that much either, just because teams ahead of them have quite a differential. For them to beat an Arsenal side that's desperately fighting for top four speaks more on how inconsistent um, and truthful I think I've been about Arsenal this season, that their defenders uh, just, I don't think, are at the pace. Um, they need help, and they're, they're not quite there yet. And I think if they get Champions League football, which I'm not so sure of now after that Tottenham game, um, I, I don't know how they cope with Champions League next year, if I'm being honest. Yeah, no, I think I think a lot of your criticisms of this Arsenal side have been pretty valid. Um, I, they do still have a game in hand over Tottenham, so they win the one game they have in hand and yep. then match Tottenham's results in its Champions League football for them next year. Um, I like, I want to disagree with with the uh, with the thought of Champions League football may end up hurting them a little bit just just for the simple fact that Champions League football is what they need to attract the, in my opinion, the caliber of player that a side like Arsenal needs to take that next yeah. step up and either like cement themselves as a top four team again, like be a team that, you know, 
the joke that Arsenal were always going to be fourth. I, I think Champions League football helps them cement their spot there and helps them sign those players that mean that. And then if if title aspirations are in their future, they need to make the Champions League and, and they need like that quality of player. I think it's going to be a lot harder for them to sign that good partner for Salabia or that real striker that you know that forward that isn't fucking Lacazette yep. um, without guaranteed Champions League football and that you know that's just my opinion there so that's why I kind of I, I see where you're coming from Josh for sure and and I don't think you're totally wrong in saying that but I think at the end of the day Champions League helps Arsenal with the direction it feels like the club wants to be taking itself in the next like season or two that's a that's a fair point i think it's a double-edged sword because ultimately it comes down to recruitment when you look at yeah. um, teams like liverpool like when they first got back in the champions league the recruitment was just special because we got Salah that year um oxley chamberlain came in that year and did wonders for the team yeah. um there was just so many incoming pieces that it was easy for liverpool to transfer and they got so many players and signings right uh, so ultimately it's going to come down to who Arsenal actually do bring in. And if they make an impact and find themselves in the squad, their recruitment this year has been good, but we know in years past that, you know, they've signed yeah. some definitely, definitely questionable people. Uh, yep. so we'll from, see. But. From Pepe to Pepe to Pepe. Socrates, Pe- Pepe is Mustafi. Uh, yeah. Mustafi. <laughs> they've had some bad, they've had some shockers in the last couple of years. Yep. So, yeah, now you make a really good point with the recruitment thing too. I think Arsenal in a really interesting spot, and uh, uh, I'm curious to see how they play out, or, or and you know how they they get on For sure. over the next couple of months here and, and going into next season. I think the um, injuries are going to be be big too for the the remainder of the season. You know, we've been we've been having an injured Tommy Asu, uh, Tierney now injured, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Yep. He's, um, out he's, he's out for a year. Yeah. So it's. Uh, I think it's going to be a tough road for Arsenal. I do, but at the end of the day, if the injury bug bites them and then depth is the issue to not get them into that fourth Champions League spot, then uh, it's just going to add add to the timeline. Uh, I think it's just kind of a wait and see. But yeah, honestly, Arsenal have impressed me this year for, from the piss-poor start, uh, being in last place to, to turning around they do deserve the the credit Arteta has has worked his ass off to bring in a couple of good pieces get rid of some dead weight and put them in a spot that looks promising for the future yep 100 percent um do we really need to talk about the city and liverpool results over the weekend no two nil everton probably should because they've lost two games on the bounce now frank has lost eight out of 12 which i think is good enough for any manager to be sacked mitch do you still feel good about that prediction Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I'm starting to agree with Mitch, man. Uh, I'm starting to feel like Mitch was right. I think I was a little ahead of the curve, but uh, I... I so Everton, just, Everton are fucking ass. Sean Dyche is a smart sucks. man. He's going to be tough to edge out in this relegation battle. He is, because he's going to be able to go out and get the points where he needs it and capitalize on those, those moments like we saw uh, yesterday. Everton lost three two to Burnley on a late goal from Corne. Um who said a really just good one season point. to be fair. He has. It's the the relegation gap for Everton is down to a point and they're even with Burnley on games played. It's good it's Burnley gonna be them and Burnley. I mean at the end of the season it's them and Burnley. I think Marsh has leads far enough away and I think he's yep. kind of building something. You can see that. It's gonna be Everton mm-hmm. or Burnley who go down. Do you think – did we – have? has anyone confirmed if that Sean Dyche locker room quote is true? Uh, yeah, I would, there's a video he, of it that's about 30 yeah. seconds. So for those of you who didn't see it, I just didn't know if it was it was fake football, fake football yeah. Twitter shit. But Sean Dyche's locker room speech, Burnley were down at half or tied, one of the two, whatever. Sean Dyche's locker room speech was, lads – I don't know if Everton actually know how to win a game and then they beat them. If that doesn't just speak volumes about the state of Everton football club right now, yeah. I don't know what, what else does. Uh, also, this has to be the end of Frank Lampard's managerial tenure, right? Yeah. He'll go never be a get pundit a job now. after this. It's, it's not, it, this is not for you, big man. Go be a pundit. 
Yeah, it's just, it, it's it's disappointing. Um, not it. I don't think it's disappointing. I, like, not, 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 every... not for not for me. For everybody that supports him and the decisions that he's made. Um, at the end of the day, like Frank Lampard being one of the best Premier League players ever, to have an unbelievable mind on the field and know how a game works, to go into a managerial position, it does suck. It does suck. Because you, you look at that Lampard Gerard debate and now we're on to the managerial portion of these and, and Gerard's ju- doing just fine with probably a lot less. He did it with Rangers. He brought them to to the top of the Scottish Premiership. He's done phenomenal with with Villa, made incredible signings and put pieces of the puzzle together to win games. Lampard goes out and bottles a lead to Burnley on a cold, wet night when he's trying to stay in the Premier League and not get relegated. Yeah, yeah he and he gets up, $200 million worth of players at Chelsea and gets sacked after a season and a half. Hasn't hasn't won a game on the road yet. I, I watched yeah, a recent at, interview at, with... At Everton. I watched a recent interview uh, Gerard did. I forget with who, um, but he talked about advice Klopp gave him when he was getting into managing. Um and it was that don't take a job based on the name on your back. Basically telling like Stevie, like make sure you're ready before you take like a proper job. Um, and I think Frank did the opposite. I think Frank took the Chelsea job based on, you know, being a famous, one of the best midfielders of all time without really having the managerial experience at Derby County uh, to do it. Yeah, I, I 100% agree. I, I, I don't know. I just don't think Frank was ever really up for uh, management. You could kind of see his Derby County side wasn't really anything special. He didn't really have any tactics at Chelsea. I just not not every good player is going to be a good manager. It's just it's just the way of the road. Not every player has it in them, and some players are better pundits than they are coaches. And that's just yeah, the simple fact of life. It's true. Go oh, hang out with Micah Richards. Right. Hey, Michael Richards. Know, is Michael awesome. Richards should never be a coach. <laughs> He's a great pundit. Him and Jamie Carragher are actually, uh, I like them quite a bit. Yeah, they're funny. I like them. Uh, but with that said, we'll hop into the UCL games from this week. Um, what do you guys want to start with? Just in order, we'll start with the Liverpool City ones. Yeah, that those were. Yeah, and then we can talk about the shock, the the craziness yeah. of the following day. Why don't you uh, break down Man City first, Pat? That one had a little bit more in it. It's probably the one that's a little bit closer going into the, the next week. Yeah, so uh, Simeone set Atletico Madrid up in essentially two banks of five against City um, and and played, you know, we're away from home. Let's do damage control and try to win at home. Uh, it was a really, really frustrating first half for City. Uh, Atletico, you know, Defended resolutely. I think they defended very organized. Um, but ultimately, and, and this is going to sound crazy, but give me a sec. Um, I think the best defensive display was actually from the side that did most of the attacking. Um, every Atletico counter was snuffed out by three, four blue shirts. Uh, Nathan Ake didn't lose an aerial duel. John Stones and Imeric Laporte looked very, very composed at the back. And ultimately, you know, Atleti set up in, like I mentioned, two banks of five. And City set up in a 3-2-5 with five forwards to match their five back. Um, It was a really interesting, you know, tactical battle of all-out attack versus all-out defense and ultimately City being able to effectively pen a pin Atletico back while sticking to their game plan and you know having those assured backs to win their aerial aerial duels to snuff out counters um ultimately is what is what won us the game uh, Kevin De Bruyne was my man of the match but um I think Nathan, Nathan Ake put in a 10 out of 10 performance at left back and uh Phil Foden coming on in the second half completely changed the game. Same with Jack Grealish. Um, I think those two made a really big impact straight off the bench. Jesus as well. All three of City's subs changed the game ultimately. Um, And yeah, really interesting. It's set up very nicely 
uh, to go to Madrid. But uh, ultimately, I think City get the job done next week. I agree with you. Um, nice, nice. We yeah. knew Atleti would frustrate them, but I don't think any of us really thought Atleti would um, take City down in a two-legged tie. Um, Mitch, do you want to kick things off for Benfica Liverpool? Yeah. Uh, all in all, I was really impressed with our side uh we played our game for for 90 minutes and we've seen the uh the setup shift a little bit it's it's more it's more play it slow take advantage of of the long balls through and the counter attack and then defend when we need to uh benfica play a really really good counter attack um so we we looked solid um, running back for, for most of the game, aside from Ibu Kanate's one gift. Um, it, it, we played 90 minutes of solid Liverpool ball. Yeah. I, I thought Kanate played really good as well. His positioning on that was so good and so yep. intelligent for how young he is. Um, ultimately, his, his foot just kind of got trapped and uh, – you know, it's a howler at the end of the day, but his positioning was good, and he's a young player. I think he'll learn from that, and he got a goal at the end of the day too, so you can't yep. um, bark at him too much. With that being said, I thought it was just a, you know, like Mitch said, a great performance from this Liverpool side. I love the lineup choice from Klopp. I thought Thiago and Kaita actually worked quite well together. Kaita almost played as a second striker um, at times. If you notice that, Mitch, he, he was getting really, really high up the pitch, and they were almost playing him um, – and Jota as strikers with Mane and Salah on the wings. Um, the other player I just want to give another shout out to is Trent Alexander Arnold. Couple of those balls he played. I mean, top ten passes I've probably seen in my life. The one where he rolls it back when he's on the right side, Mitch, and he hits the ball over to Salah. The one where Salah yep. should have dinked it earlier. Uh, that's one of the better passes I think I have ever seen watching soccer. Um, especially the way he just like rolled the defender. And he didn't like necessarily have time to do it and just took the entire team out of the play. Uh, anyone who questions him being the best right back in the world is absolutely delusional. Especially after Chelsea's display, which we'll talk about. But uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I agree with you. And then Luis Diaz, yeah. I, going into it, I knew he was going to have, have a game and he ended up being the man of the match with a goal and an assist. Um, Trent's ball over to Diaz for the assist another un unbelievable cross field yep. ball right on Diaz's head um heads it across for Mane to 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 clean up and then I think just one one more point um before we move on from this game I I think this is this is probably Salah's last game with his his yips we noticed it after AFCON um it took him it took him a couple games to get over the the frustration I'm sure um just not looking as clinical uh, in the last last couple of games from Salah. Yeah, tired. He played a fuck ton of games lately, to be fair. Um, yep. And we, we didn't talk about this either. We don't have to spend time on this, really, but contract looks like it could be incoming in the next couple of weeks. I don't think they would ever want to do that right before a big game or even in the run-in to a title. I think that puts a lot of pressure and unnecessary talk around Liverpool and Salah especially. If they were like were to announce four hundred thousand dollar wages and then right at the end of the season we're playing finals. Unnecessary, but I do think that is coming soon. Um elsewhere we can talk about the surprise result first. Virial beating Bayern one nil at home. Uh crazy game. Looked like a crazy environment for the yellow submarine. Bayern should still be favored, I would think, going into the second leg at the Allianz. Uh but what'd you guys take away from that first one? The Villarreal outside are the dark horses, man. They they beat Juve. They, you know, nobody thought that Juve was going to lose at home, and then look yep. what happened. So, Bayern are definitely a better side than Juve. Don't get it twisted. But <laughs> how do you feel uh, about I, Liverpool if they got Villarreal, Pat? Do you think that's a really easy road? Do you think that's fortunate? Well, yeah, because it's not Bayern, yep. but. I think this Villarreal, Villarreal, Villarreal I, got, I got to pronounce their names right, or some German dude's going to call me fucking stupid in our Instagram. <laughs> I think Villarreal are a very good team. Um, and I think you made the point in the Juve tie that they're very, very organized and their home stadium is not an easy place to go and play. Yeah. Bayern have just experienced that. Um, 
That being said, I think Liverpool would have beaten Bayern if they got them in the semifinals. So I don't think it matters too, too much. Uh, it just, it's tricky to say. Um, I don't want to disrespect Villarreal and call them easy because if they beat, if they successfully get by Bayern in the second leg, their road to the final, so to speak, if they were to beat you, would have been Juve, Bayern Munich, Liverpool, and then a Champions League final. So clearly they're doing something right. They're frustrating these big sides and they're doing what they have to do to, to win games. Um, we know Juve can defend and they put three by Juve in Italy. So I wouldn't call this tie, you know, I, I still favor Bayern, but I, I think I wouldn't be surprised if at the end of 90 minutes next week, your uh, Liverpool are facing Villarreal in the semifinals in the Champions League. Bayern haven't been like, They've been putting a lot of goals in, but they've drawn like two games in the last five, lost one now. So they've only won two and five in all competitions. They're kind of like still in that rut, it seems like, from January, February when they were without Neuer and Alfonso Davies. And even though they have them back, they're still kind of hitting that rut. Um, yeah. yeah. So Neuer, Neuer did look shaky. I, I don't think he's gotten the run of games he needs in the position that Bayern's yeah. in. Um, And it, Watching the game, it should have been 2-0, 3-0. Villarreal played a a very, very, very good game. Um, But with a lead like this going into an away leg, I don't think it's going to be Salzburg levels. It's not going to be like some 7-1 trouncing. Um, But it's going to be a close race. Villarreal have the, the means. They know they have the means now to go out and get a result. Um, so they just have to play their game and, and it'll, it'll be a lot closer than I think we'll, we'll see it coming. Um, yeah, yeah for definitely sure. agree with that. And then we got Chelsea Real Madrid last, uh, that one's going in favor of Madrid. Thanks to a Benzi hat trick. Benzema is the best player in the fucking world right now. Sorry. Right yeah, now. No. Yeah. On, on current it. form. Dude, dude's Absolutely. on fire. Yep. But when, when was the last time you saw any player after, before Ronaldo score hat tricks in back-to-back Champions League knockout ties? It's crazy. Dude is on another level. Uh, aging like fucking fine wine. Big Benz, baby. Uh, I like Benzema a lot. And he played incredible. Super involved in the buildup to two of the goals, too. So it's not like he was just poaching. Those headers Played were ball. ridiculous, even if he was poaching. Yeah. The, the, yeah. the accuracy on those headers was world-class. Especially yeah, played, in the weather they had. It Played the ball out shit. to Vinicius to yep. make that first goal happen. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's a it, he's very good, and, and Real Madrid are going through. Some of those Chelsea players have to take a hard look at themselves after that game. Tiago Silva and Rudiger being two of them. I thought uh, Rudiger's positioning, I don't remember which. It was one of the first two goals was horrendous. It was the, it was the second one. Yeah, Silva was atrocious. And then Mendy, just that howler of a pass. I don't know what he was trying to do there. Uh, ball gets kind of stuck under him maybe. It rolls a couple feet and then Benzema's you know off to the races with that one. Uh, and these are players, you know, I've been hearing from Chelsea fans. Uh have been you know world class. They're in they're in a bunch of different conversations. Uh, I I don't know after that game. <laughs> Vinicius yeah, they Junior, a couple of tough ones. Vinicius Junior made Reese James' life a living <laughs> hell for ninety minutes. I uh, England starting I right that, back. You know, I think that says everything we need to hear about like this game. Um, like. King Kareem doing his thing yet again. Yep. Do we want to get into the Premier League, boys? Yeah. Do you want to? So I think the best way to format this, because we're going to have a lot to say <laughs> about one fixture in particular this weekend. Um, let's quickly run through. Quickly, run, yeah, exactly. We're going to have a lot to say about Everton, Man United. Yep. Yes. Um, we'll go through the first games and then we'll get into Liverpool yeah, City after. Quickly run through these picks and then we can spend some time uh, yes. on on the the important game of the weekend, which which is Brentford West Ham. <laughs> Correct. Um, so first game, Everton Man United. This one's interesting because both of these teams are kind of in precarious situations. 
Uh, I'm going to take the Man United money line, minus 130. A little bit of a square pick here, but I don't really care. United have won three out of five against Everton. These games have all been high scoring as well. They're averaging 3.6 total goals per game. So I'm, I'm expecting goals in this one too. Um, I mean, Everton have just been abysmal. Uh, again, yeah, both sides are fucking ass. Yeah, but Man United's going to get over in, at the end of the day here because Everton's defense yeah. is just shambles. So I could like weirdly enough see Man United like getting like pumping Everton. Honestly, yeah, exactly. That's what I see in this too, and I think this may be. I don't know like when the situation is where F- Frank Lampard does get sacked, but I think it could be this weekend. Uh, it's so, dude. If you sack a guy with eight games left in the season, like <laughs> Big Sam is the only way you do it. He's the only person you would do it for. Right? Can you sack Frank Lampard, bring in Big Sam, and stay up with only eight games left in the season, though? I mean, Big Sam's on a cold streak of one, so <laughs> I think what that West Brom side got relegated last year. Um, that they were literally uns. They were like. <laughs> negative 50 goal differential that side was fucking dog shit yeah they were bad um are they coming back up i i don't think so they are i think so no i, I, I thought they were, right now it's fulham top. and bournemouth are one and two. Oh, so, so they're in, in a playoff spot though okay there's some fun ones in there nottingham's hanging around i'd love to see nottingham back in the front i can't wait to talk about the fucking playoffs side note yes. keep saying keep saying your picks but i can't wait also, I mean, we'll get through the picks, I promise. We should have a relegation playoff as well, like how they do in Germany, where the last relegation spot faces the last promotion spot in the league below. And You then just want everything to get relegated. <laughs> I think that would be a fun system. <laughs> um, anyway, Arsenal-Brighton. This one's a good one. Uh, definitely one to watch out for. I have over 2.5 in this. Uh, that's plus 105. And I have over 10.5 corners as well at minus 110. Um, Arsenal, you know, got their asses kicked in the last game. And I think they'll bounce back from that. They seem like a side that do have a little bit of bounce back motivation in them. Um, and I have the corner pick mainly just because Everton really have to go for this. They need top four. Um, so I think the more pressure, uh, you know, ultimately will lead to more corners. It's kind of When he said Everton, point. he meant Arsenal. For Did everybody I say Everton? He's got the blues on the brain. Ugh. They stay lurking. Aston Villa Tottenham um, next up. This one's a weird one. I've bet a lot on Aston Villa lately and just has not worked out for me. Tottenham have been playing pretty good lately. I mean, uh, who was that thrashing against just uh, last weekend? Who were they playing? They beat really bad. Was it 4 1 or 5 1? Something crazy. Research team? Newcastle. Yeah, so yeah that's a good win. I'll, I'll take that. Um, so, with that being said, I have Tottenham money line because I think Tottenham's getting really close to top four as well. Um, and I also have Kane to score. Plus 150 is ridiculous value for that to score any time for Harry Kane. Uh, Villa's defense, as we know, is a bit shaky. I love that matchup of Kane and Tyrone Mings. There's bound to be a goal there. Right now, Tottenham do sit in fourth on yep. goal differential. They're tied at 54 points with Arsenal, and okay. they are plus five goals on Arsenal. And Arsenal has the game in hand, though. Yeah. Yes. Um, Leicester Palace is next. I have under 2.5 goals in that, minus 115. Um, Leicester have scored under 2.5 and 5 out of their last 7 uh, neither of these teams really have motivation for a win I, I would say because neither of them are really getting into a European spot I see this being a little bit more of a mellow one and then Brentford West Ham finally I have the West Ham draw no bet draw no bet um, picks have been pretty good for me lately so I'm going to ride out that one I know West Ham had to play a tough Lyon side today uh, but I don't see Brentford really getting a result against them. I think West Ham are a little bit too organized. All right. Josh. It's time. Give us your pick first, and then let's let's have a really friendly discussion. It's not going to be friendly. Really similar <laughs> friendly discussion. You go with Ebu? 
Yeah, I, I, I went with the Ibu graphic. I know Ibu's I not going to start, but uh, Ibu deserved a picture. We've been going with the same guys, so. Yes, he does. He does deserve <sighs> it. Uh, so you want me to get my picks first? Yep, give yep, the pick first. Get, pick. Okay. get it out of the get way. I have a Dude. first pick, a bit of a, a weird one. Over 10.5 corners, plus 105. We're rooting for corners in this one. Uh, these teams are number one and number two in overall corners taken this year. I think both of them will be trying to win this game. So with that pressure, I think there'll be a little bit more corners than the first match. The first match, there was only seven. I think we do get over the 10 mark in this one. Um, I'm also, I feel like it would just be un. It would be kind of corny of me if I didn't take the Liverpool money line. I think the Liverpool draw no bet is probably the safer option. Um, Because realistically, like if I had to put pick a result in this game, I would probably say it's a draw. Um, I feel like a lot of times when City and Liverpool play, when there's a lot of buildup, which I know is like every time they play, but really when uh, it seems like the stakes are higher, it always ends up in like a nil-nil draw or something boring and it's like a snooze fest. No, we're a two um, one win. <laughs> fair. Um but I could see that happening, and then for the last seven games, six or seven games of the season, it's still that like title clinching kind of feeling where it's like we feel like we're going through hell every week. I could totally yeah. see that happening, so a draw isn't out of the question. But like I said, it's corny of me if I don't ride with Liverpool. Uh Liverpool money line also is plus two thirty five, which is ridiculous. I know Liverpool haven't beaten Man City at the Eddie had since like 2018 since the champions league or whatever. Uh, but I'll ride with my boys. And then I also have Liverpool over 1.5 goals as well. Cause with a Liverpool win, I think you need two goals against the city side. You're not going to get one and win. Um, so with that Liverpool pick of the money line, I feel like I also have to take Liverpool scoring twice um, because there's no way they're going to beat city scoring once. Yeah. You, you guys aren't crystal palace. You can't beat us one though. <laughs> Fair. Uh, so those are the three picks. They kind of all go in hand in hand with each other a little bit. So we'll see how it plays out. But um, do we want to get into the the Liverpool talking points? And Mitch, you can go first, and maybe we can work back to me at the end. We got a lot. We, we got a lot going into we can, this. We we can just chat. We can, we can just, just chat, chat about Let's what chat. both sides, what what we expected of both sides. You guys are Liverpool fans, so. I'll certainly let you do the bulk of the talking when we're talking about your team, but you know, I got things I want to say about both sides. So. Yes. Um, I think, I think I'll start with how fucking nervous I am first and foremost. Um, I am very excited to be watching this match from the comfort of Pat's living room so I can live. <laughs> would in you be place. more nervous or less nervous or would you, would you be less nervous if I wasn't sitting 15 feet away from you for two hours uh yes and no because they like when when we were sitting in your living room watching the uh the united liverpool game that was a lot of fun that was like i got to talk my shit i got to just celebrate so hard now it's all bets are off we might need to hide the kitchen knives kind of territory. The I would one, never stab you. <laughs> the one positive thing about watching the game by myself at my house is I don't have to go anywhere and I don't have to be concerned about what I hit or throw. Um, but no. Real talk. We're rested up. We don't have a lot of injuries, if any. Just knocks here and there from playing quite a bit. Um but I, I don't know, Josh. Yeah, I think, uh, like you said, no injuries. I like that Salamane and Tiago all played just an hour at Benfica. Mm-hmm. I think that was smart from uh, Jurgen. Kind of shows his hand a little bit to who he's going to play, as well as Ibu playing. I think that shows his hand that Matip is the definite starter as Virgil's center back partner. Um, it's going to be a real nervy game, isn't it? I feel like the first thirty minutes, it, it's. N- no one's really going to show their hand in terms of like on field play. Um, I think after that, it might break down a little bit and we'll see some real action, but it, it, we'd be lying if we said it's easy to predict these games. Um, we never can predict them accurately. 
it's because when you have world class players like that, anyone can kind of make a difference with one kick of the ball. Um, it's going to be a tough one at the Eddie had, but ultimately it's going to decide the title. I think there is something special about this Liverpool side. We've been saying it all year. It feels like there's trophies in them. If Liverpool are a team that's going to win another Premier League trophy uh, with fans in the ground against the other best team in the world, they're going to win on Sunday. Uh, and I'm backing them to do that. Pat, what do you got over there? <sighs> okay. So, cup top, well, well, we'll go logistics first. Uh, City are without Ruben Diaz. I think that's a really, it's unfortunate. I would like both sides to be top going into this. Um, I like that you guys have no real injuries. Uh, so when we beat you, you can't have any excuses. Um, we've been weird in front of goal. You know, some games where we're hitting for a lot, other games we're not. A lot of time it's been like 2-0, 2-1. Um, and, and that's just, you know, a product of not having a recognized forward uh, in the side, really. Um, that being said, Kevin De Bruyne is hitting top form right now. Uh, he just scored his, I, I, wanna, I believe it's 10th Premier League goal uh, last week against uh, Burnley. He's playing super, super well um, in a determined Kevin De Bruyne is as scary, in my opinion, as an angry Mohamed Salah. Um, when he wants to win a game, he will take a game by the scruff of the neck and he will win it. We've seen that in the Champions League last season. He won us a ton of games in that run to the final. We saw it against Atletico Madrid. His, you know, him and Foden, individual quality, just making the difference, yep. winning a really tough game. Um, I think our defense has shown that it's not as shaky as it has been in the past. Um, I think we're getting better at controlling the counters and successfully implementing that high line. Um, and I think that's a, a really big key to victory. If City are going to come away with three points is minimizing um, how quickly Liverpool can get out when they break because Liverpool will break. They, they will get forward on the counter. Um, they're, they're too good to press into oblivion. Like some of these bad sides, they will break the press and, and they will get forward and they will break the lines. It's how well do City minimize that? And, and I think if Atleti are anything to show by it, we have that quality to pin a team back and make it really tough for them to get out of their own half. Um, uh, and I think this game is really going to come down to the first goal. I know it's maybe a little bit of a cliche to say, um, but in, in big games especially – if City don't score the first goal, they very rarely go on to win the game. Um, and, and I think Liverpool have that quality to come back. So I think City getting that first goal is even more important to set them up to control the game and be able to play their game with a one-goal cushion. So, so I think if City score early, they're in a really good uh, place to take the three points. And uh, last note is I think Phil Foden has to start the game. Yeah. Um, He's shown time and time again this season that he is a big game player. He's up for these ties that really, really matter. Um, he was really up for Liverpool, the 2-2 we had earlier in the year. He was really up for the most recent Manchester derby. Uh, he was up for that game we finally won at Anfield. Granted, no fans, you know, end of a COVID season. It's like, I'll count that as like half a win at Anfield. When we beat you with fans, I'll be happy about it. Um but he, he gets up for these games. He was big in the Champions League last season. Uh, he came off the bench against Atletico Madrid at the midweek, made an instant impact in like under five minutes, assisted De, uh, De Bruyne for the first goal. So he has to start the game 100%. Um, outside of that, uh, I am backing City in this game. Uh, I've been a little bit reserved lately because, you know, I've been nervous. Uh, but if there's one thing I know about this City side, especially – over these past couple of years, it's that in a tight title race, uh, it's better to back them than to not because they've shown me that they have the merit now to see out a tough title race. Um, and I think they'll do it. I think they'll do it at the weekend. Uh, I, th I think City win 2-1. Pat, let me ask uh, you a quick question. Yeah. Uh, and you can tell me if you think I'm like blatantly wrong. Do you think Liverpool are more dangerous off the bench? I think it depends where. Like, if you bring on Diaz and Firmino with 20 minutes to go, does that scare you at all? Uh, are you scared of Riyad Mahrez coming on? 
See, well, that's a point, but you know we've, I mean? we've I think always we dealt with that playing you. We've always dealt with that. I feel like this is the f- first time where Liverpool re- legitimately has two attackers that are world-class to bring on the pitch uh, against you. Yeah, I-, I think that the changes you can make, it, especially if things aren't going your way in the first 45, are terrifying. Um, I think we have different kinds of quality that we can bring off the bench. Um, I, I know it's Grealish hasn't been, been having his best year for City, but the presence that he has and the attention he demands with how direct of a runner he is is very different than, say, a Raheem Sterling, who's only going to be looking to run in behind. So um, I don't think you're more scary. I think that – I say excuse me your your forwards are a bit more what what you can bring off the bench is maybe a bit more um explosive than what city can bring off the bench but i think what city bring off the bench can change the game in in more than one way um i I think firmino is definitely a a different type of player but i think if if the game is just screaming out for another wide player Diaz for Salah and Mane is more of a like for like change where I think bringing on a Mares or bringing on a Grealish or bringing on a, a Foden or a player like that is much different of a, it, it's a different type of challenge for your fullback. So I think our players are a bit more dynamic and can, and can shape a game differently mm-hmm. where you're like very like for like, and that's because like your forwards do very specific things and they do those specific things extremely well hence why you've been so successful because you have a very specific type of player that you like to have in the side if, if that makes sense yeah no totally does i think it's just the first time we've had this much depth like in a game against you um, yeah the only other thing that i really kind of wanted to point out is that i do think this game could come down to goalkeeping just has that feeling that it could be like a, a big save that really um does it or a, a, an error and I think on form, we have the edge on that right now with Allison over Ederson. Oh, yeah, um, 100%. So I I don't know. I just have this feeling that it's going to come down to a goalkeeping performance. Um, and I, I, uh, I think this game is going to be won and lost in the midfield, personally. Well, that's true, too, because they both play so high lines that it's mm-hmm. ultimately going to be a pass or um, kind of succession of passes that is going to lead to a goal. Well, well I, I, that, too. And I think it's going to be... And I, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe this is the City fan in me talking, but to me it feels like, can you do enough to disrupt our midfield's rhythm yep. in the first 15, 20 minutes? Can you make us uncomfortable enough where we're making a lot of errors? Or are we going to find our feet and, and get you into that rhythm? Because mm-hmm. we've seen City take over games a lot of the time if, if a team can't really come out and, and disrupt them. Yep. Uh, really good examples like palace and tottenham did a really good job of disrupting city and that's why they got the points off them um and and i think if liverpool do that they'll probably win the game um so yeah i I think that's what i mean by the game is won and lost in the midfield is can you get de bruyne uncomfortable can you stop bernardo from from the getting these little interceptions and finding his feet can you make rodri uncomfortable in possession early in the game things like that i think are really going to decide the game and kind of piggybacking off of that i i i think we can and i think it depends on who we see in in our liverpool midfield to start the game but i do agree with josh here that on on current form allison gives us that little extra edge over city's lack of being able to be as clinical in front of net they you've seen it happen a lot over the last month, month and a half where city are doing everything they can in the midfield to open up those lanes for your wingers to get in and take a shot. And we're, we're pulling stuff wide, we're pushing stuff and, and, and stuff's getting hit over the crossbar a lot more than on target. So the, the, the lack there of goal, like both sides are playing in a position where we're not going out for, four goals five goals we're looking to capitalize on those moments here and there grab a couple of goals and get three points and i i think that could be the big big thing i think we have plenty of depth to disrupt city in the midfield i think both sides will be playing a lot through the midfield 
but I think when it comes down to those moments when you work in the midfield, go to capitalize on on a mistake and get into open play, who's going to be the ones finishing the goals? Yeah, that's right. a good point, Mitch. I'm I'm actually just looking up something really quick because I'm trying to remember who we started, um, in that first game. I just want to see the lineup we had. Yeah, see, we we did have Fabinho, um, but the big one that we had was Curtis Jones started that that game against City last. Oh uh, yeah, I'm that's right. That was uh, Tiago was injured, right? Tiago yeah. was injured, and I will say one thing. I know Tiago's had like kind of an up and down spell at Liverpool, where I don't think last year he really hit his peak. I think Tiago has been very, very, very good lately. I don't think Liverpool have lost a game where him, Jordan Henderson, and Fabinho play together. I do think that'll be the midfield Klopp goes with as well. Um, and I think Tiago does provide a presence for Liverpool um, where he can pressure City's midfield and win that help Liverpool win that midfield battle where I don't think we've been able to say that in years prior against City that we legitimately could outrun their midfield. With Tiago, we can. And with Hendo not having to play as defensively, exactly. too, his game has developed a lot over the last two years where having Tiago on the left side of the midfield – who likes to drop back and open up play with a creative touch allows Jordan Henderson to get up and press should the ball get get um, lost or should we have an errant pass when we're trying to push it up to to the nine um, whatever it may be Hendo's Hendo's been there to collect and we've seen that through the the Champions League stints that he's had over the last you know month month and a half. Mm-hmm. I think yeah, that's... I, I think no matter what happens, it's going to be a really interesting game. Um, it's a clash of titans. It's it's a clash of the two best sides in the world right now, and uh, it's going to be exciting. It, sure. it, these games are always really exciting. They're always really good tactical battles. Um, the eleven that both sides put out. Um, I think Gears is a little more set in stone. Um, who the Definitely. fuck knows what Guardiola's going to do come match day? So that's uh, it's the spicy part about being a City fan. You never uh, know. Speaking of gonna... elevens, do we want to go around and give our Liverpool City combined elevens? Yeah, do you want to just go in order we have them on the paper here? Sure. Um, so, goalkeeper, I don't really think there's much debate on this. Um, it's Allison. Uh, I'm Zach Steffen. <laughs> he's the most on-form goalkeeper in the world right now, I would say. Arguably one of Liverpool's most important players this season. I, I don't know if there's a stat to tell you how many games he has helped us win, but it would probably surely be up there with the likes of Mo Salah and, and the rest of our attackers. Um, no, he's got like 18 clean sheets. That's a pretty good. <laughs> that's a pretty good one to start with. Exactly. Um, left back. I have a, a different answer here, and I, I kind of make up for it later on. I feel like, but I do have Andy Robertson. Uh, didn't have the best first half of the season. I think he's really came along in recent matches. Um, we saw his corner delivery, which I think has been much better in recent weeks. We saw that against Benfica, putting one on Kanate's head. Uh, I just think he's been really good. There, there's definitely an argument for Cancelo here, but. I'll take Robertson, um, Van Dyke and Diaz in the middle. Obviously, Diaz isn't playing this game, so you could throw either John Stones or Joel Motip in there if you want to count like active players. Um, Trent on the right, really no debate there. I have a midfield trio of Fabinho, De Bruyne, Bernardo. Um, again, no arguments in that for me. I think Fabinho's um, kind of just by far the better CDM than Rodri. Yeah, I'm going to argue that when it gets to my turn. Fair I'm enough. Gonna argue fair enough. I think we're I, I th- the best DM in the world this season. I think they both play huge parts for our team, and, and it's hard for us to see kind of how the other one would be better because we both just see like, oh, my God, he's the most important part of the spine for our team, and it's the same thing for both of us. Um, and then my top three, I have Salah, Jota, um, and then Foden as my left winger. I think he's a, um, just been a little bit more consistent probably than Sadio Mane has been this season, and I think he scares me a bit more um, than Mane scares Man City, if we're being honest. It's fair. I, I was conflicted with that. I'll, I'll jump into my team and we can we can chat. There's very few differences, I, I will say. Um, in goal, I have Allison. He's my player of the year candidate right now. If, if it came down to voting today, I would vote for Allison for PFA player of the year or whatever fans can vote for. EA Sports yeah, player of the year or some no. shit. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I would vote for Allison. Um, I'd have Kinsella at left back. I think him and Trent have been the two best fullbacks in the league this year, bar none. Kinsella's done, you know, like 60% of his work on the left. Um, 
he's a winger that's an, also a very good defender he plays inverted I, I think he's phenomenal and Virgil van Dijk and Ruben Diaz in the, in the middle um with Diaz being injured I would put stones there um and then Trent yeah best right back in the world absolutely incredible 12 assists from the fullback position or 11 assists from the fullback position is just insane um 1v1 defending is a little shaky, but he, I think he's improved a little bit this year there. Barely. Barely. I will say barely, but he has improved a little bit. Um, he's good. I, I, I like him a lot. I think he's definitely he, – he feels like a generational type of player in that position, and um, that's the most praise I'm giving a Liverpool player today. Fuck you guys. Um, midfield, I have Rodri, KDB, and Bernardo. I think Rodri has been the best defensive mid this year, in my opinion. Um I think he's really stepped up. I think in possession, he's a little bit more comfortable than Fabinho on the ball. I think they're both just as good in the air. Um, maybe maybe Fabinho a little better in fairness. Um, I, I think where Fabinho might have Rodri in terms of athleticism and, you know, like shithousery, like killing someone in the midfield, I think Rodri makes up for it uh, by be having, you know, impeccable positioning. Um, Rodri's always there to clean a pass up, not because he's just getting back and breaking up the play, but because he's always one or two steps ahead of the counterattack. Um, and, and that's why I like Rodri a little bit more. I, I think the the football brain in Rodri for me is just a little bigger than Fabinho, and that's no knock on Fabinho. I think Fabinho is a phenomenal player. Yeah, they are different, to be fair. Fabinho yeah. is just fucking huge. I mean, he's a skeleton of a man. He just I think that I think, like, gives him a little bit of an edge, Rodri. I think you're right. Better positioning, probably. Yeah. I, I like I, I value the brain on Rodri, but that's no knock on Fabinho. I think he's an amazing player and, and an amazing defensive midfielder. Um, when City needed to sign a right back and a defensive mid, we were trying to sign Fabinho, and I wanted him bad, real bad. So I, I rate him super highly. I just think Rodri's been a little bit better this season, and that's probably a preference thing at the end of the day. Um, De Bruyne and Bernardo, there's no fucking arguing there. Do one if you disagree. Um, and my front three are Salah, Jata, and Mane. I think they've been the three best forwards in the league this year, bar none. I get the Foden argument, um, but I, I just think Mane's a better player right now than Phil Foden is. Um, I think Jata and Salah have been the two best forwards in the league, and and Salah's a player of the or a player of the year candidate for sure. So he he has to make it. I think he's the only only one that you cannot argue against. Foden's like form. Sane for me. I don't think he's better than Mane, but he like he scares the shit out of me. Yeah, I think Foden's only going to get better too, which is the the best part about him. Uh, but he's young, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's the only reason I don't have him there right now is I don't go. I don't think he is better than Mane, uh, as just like you know pound for pound, skill set for skill set. I just think Mane is a better player than him right now. But that's not to say that him being, I think him being a big game player and like being up for this kind of game certainly gives him a lot of merit to be in that front three absolutely and then i i can just kind of go through mine um and that allison Cancelo on the left virgil and diaz uh as the center back pairing trent on the right i got fabinho at cdm i i think it does just boil down to the preference and and the role that they play in our specific teams obviously it's a little bit different um but i think fabinho does his job to the fullest and uh i uh, i bleed red blood so there that is uh kdb and bernardo uh and then salah jota and mane up top i think have been imperious this season yeah nothing wrong with that was, i think we only really differed in a couple positions there so this was um really civil you probably could you probably could if you wanted to it, it would be tough um and again i think we both kind of formed this after a 4-3-3 with a cdm you probably yeah. could throw a just a regular cm in there and argue for uh tiago in my opinion um, see in my mind bernardo is that regular cm no but i'm saying like instead of choosing a cdm like throwing tiago in there and just like running three cms that's fair but, but i think I Fabinho and rodri are both better midfielders than tiago at the end of the day too yeah i i yeah and i i think just on the season like Fabinho and Rodri have done more and have been physically fit enough to play more. Um, yep. As of late, like going into this game, yes, you could give Tiago a shout just for how he's been playing. But all in all, uh, I, I would stick with stick with the six there. This was uh, 
Well, like I like I said, uh, this was unbelievably civil. We're yeah, gonna be on I pins th- and needles this weekend, though. It, it's the calm before the storm. It it really is. Like I can already feel it in my gut. My hands are already like, my palms are sweaty a little bit. Like I'm I'm nervous. Like it's a I'm big good. Game. I feel great. I'm gonna drink in the shower on Sunday morning. <laughs> It's a little bit one of those games, though, like where like you don't want to make like huge claims before it because you don't want to like come off as a knob before a game if like you know the other team has potential to beat you, so you can't go out making like empty claims or no, you this, know what I, I mean. Don't I think that's why it's game. civil though. It's like we're both a little bit nervous. Yeah, and uh, I heard Pat said two one city. Yeah, Gosh, did, I think City you, are winning. And my score prediction is two one Man City. You, I think it's a repeat of the eighteen nineteen score line. You uh you got a score prediction, Josh, before we uh send it home and wait to see what happens on Sunday. Four two Liverpool. Four two suck my dick, Josh. Four two Liverpool. I am going to split the gap and I am going to say three one Liverpool. Jesus fucking Christ. Four two. Four two. We're gonna go straight. Uh, to get not civil. Jesus. Twenty eighteen. Not the Champions League. <laughs> I, I think it's gonna be a goal fest. I think we're due for one. Uh, it's been like two one, one nil, zero zero. I mean, you, you beat us four one, but that was like a horrendous game from Allison. I, I we're due for a Liverpool trouncing. And I think yeah, not at fu- not at the Etihad though. Relax, big man. Hey, fuck. The Etihad isn't the same. Don't want to make any outlandish claims. And he's like, oh yeah, Liverpool are gonna fucking put four past them. I get right a better at environment at my Sunday Sunday league games. Yeah, Liverpool aren't scared of the Etihad. Scared they, of some, they should some be. Blue moon rising. Last time you showed up there in a title race, you fucking lost. <laughs> Relax, buddy. Remember, you're you're the one chasing here. Liverpool are the better chasers. You guys have pressure. Uh, yeah, you're definitely the better chasers. Not really. The last it was, time you were... it was civil until the last uh, two minutes of the podcast. Yeah, because you said you're going to put <laughs> four by us. I'm going to be on. bold. I'm going to be bold. You, you beat us 4-1 like a year ago. That's I not... didn't predict that. I and mean, This also isn't the middle of a COVID season. No, I, yeah, I'm predicting it. Li- this Liverpool team is different. I'm standing by my claims. I backed Liverpool. Uh, yeah, they are different. They can't bottle a title this year. They just aren't ever going to catch us. No, <laughs> not true. <laughs> I'm sick of you. Send us home, Mitch. I'm angry now. If you made it this far, if you sat through Josh and Pat <laughs> bickering for the last three minutes, we appreciate you. Always remember to uh, to give us a follow, ring the bell if you're watching on YouTube, so you get notified when we upload weekly episodes. Usually end of the week, Thursday, Friday, depends on when we record and what's going on. But as always, we appreciate you for for riding it out with the main stand. Episode 34. We will see you guys next week. Deuces. Peace. Peace.